Hi, everybody. Welcome to reunion. I love the, la the chatting and the laughter. I always say, I said this in my first session, so you'll hear it again. This is always my favorite time of year, professionally, because everybody's happy. You're all just reunited. It feels so good, and everybody's graduating, and life is sweet. So welcome to reunion. And for me, this is a reunion of sorts as well. Um, I'm just briefly, I'll introduce myself, Bryn Panay Burkhart. My role now is I'm the dedicated executive career coach for alumni in the career development office. Did you know that we have a little bit of dedicated alumni career support for you? There should be a, um, on the mobile app, you should see a resource page if you're, not, if you're wondering what career services are available to you. So it includes coaching, um, support around self-assessment, resume cover letter, branding, interviewing, salary negotiation, the whole bit, okay? So, I've been at Sloan now for 13 years in a few different roles, have been dedicated to alumni for the past seven, and I love it. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. After working with execs and MBAs for almost 20 years, what I have found is that networking is a very daunting subject for most people, right? It's weighty, people don't know how to do it, it evokes some anxiety, and because of that, networking in general just gets a bad rap. And I think what I found is it's because most alums I work with view networking as a function of a job search. So I need a job, therefore I'm going to network and increase my chances of getting that job. And that sets it up to be quite one-sided, right? It's a means to an end. It's like a hurdle you have to overcome. You've got to like get up the gumption to go out and, and talk to people, right? So I'm hoping to debunk that approach today, and I'm going to share a networking approach that will be smart and practical. This is really going to be, if you were in my, how many people were in my earlier session? Okay, so some, not a lot. So our, my earlier session was quite strategic. This is going to be more tactical. This is kind of the how-tos of networking when it comes to a network job, job search. So I usually like to do a lot of interactive, as I did with my first workshop. This won't be as interactive, but it will, you'll, you'll get a lot of takeaways, okay? So <clears throat> we're going to talk about how to think about who you know, organizing your contacts, communicating with them effectively, acquiring new contacts, and then conducting effective, efficient networking meetings in only 20 minutes with a five-step, five-question structure. So by the end of the hour and a half, Hopefully, the, it, this won't be as daunting anymore. You're going to feel like you can network with confidence and network intelligently. And you'll begin to realize this is something you can and should be doing right now, even if you're not in transition. Because one thing I know for sure is that networking is an essential component of lifelong career management. And it's not just when you're in a job search. Right? OK? Sound good? All right, so we're going to kick it off. Um, I did this in my first workshop, too. I want to get some input from you, and I'm going to use this polling system called Poll Everywhere, founded by a 2009 alum. I didn't know he was 2009 until today. Um, this is super easy. I'm going to ask you to just pull out your mobile device, your, your phone. If you want to use your laptop and use a web browser, you're welcome to as well. And for those of you using your phone, send a text message to this number, 22333. Two twos, three threes. In the body of the email, or the, te sorry, the text message, just type my name, Bryn, B-R-Y-N. Capitalization doesn't matter. Okay, and then you'll see that you can join, you have joined my poll. Anybody using a web browser? If, okay, so the address is here, pollev, pollev.com backslash Bryn, and you should join my poll. Okay, we good? All right. This will be easy. This is anonymous. I just want to get some info from you because you're a big group. <clears throat> Here's my poll. How do you feel about networking? I want words, short phrases. You can type in up to two entries. Text me. What are your general thoughts about networking? What does it bring up for you? And we should be, okay, I see. Fun. Excellent. Anxiety. Daunting. BS. Hey, I appreciate that. It's a pain. 
A lot of work. These are coming in kind of slow. They usually pop, 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 but. Okay, so far, you know, I'm, it's interesting. It should have been a word cloud, and it looks like it's coming in as a list. So I'll just read off some, and then we'll, we'll see. So far, I think we are um, leaning towards more challenging, uncomfortable, angst, daunting. We do get some natural, useful, sleazy, hmm. intimidating, totally get it. More useful. Okay, I'll give it another maybe 30 seconds so that we're not spending like the stress. Okay, I like networking. It's essential for career advancement. Who is that? <laughs> Raise your hand. Come up here with me. Energizing, scary, exciting, and terrifying. Excellent, because yeah, you're embracing both ways. Time intensive, time intensive. We're gonna socially acceptable way of prostitution. Okay, so. When I say that you're going to put yourself out there, that's not what I mean. <laughs> Awkward root canal. OK, like I need a drink. Weird. OK, I think we get the gist. So I'm going to start with a simple truth. And we'll see these still coming in. Here's the deal. Actually, thank you for your input. I'm going to move to my, I'm going to move to my next slide. All right, simple truth, guys. How you approach networking is going to inform your experience of it. So if you think networking is awkward or dreadful or <laughs> prostitution, right, then that is the energy <laughs> that you will bring to it, and that is the experience that you will have of it. So what I'm saying is how you perceive any topic, really, and this can be anything, any subject, any topic, any person, the lens in which you view that topic is going to inform how you approach it and how you experience it. Here's another simple truth. Each of us in this room, if we choose, has the power to make a conscious choice to just try a different perspective. So I want you to just play with me a little bit, you know. Oftentimes with Network, or those of you that were not saying such favorable things about networking anyway. I'd love for you to just kind of open your mind a little bit. So often we get stuck in a perspective in one way of viewing things, right? I mean, look at like this huge political chasm that exists in our country. We are so entrenched in our ways. We are right. There's no way they are right. What if we were just to kind of play and try on a different perspective? Doesn't mean we have to adopt it, but if we could all be open to shifting our perspective to things, we might get unstuck in some ways. All right, so that I will not stay on politics. Let's go back to networking, right? That's a little safer for me, OK? My hope is that even by putting the word intelligent in front of networking, I've begun to shift your perspective about what it could be, OK? So here is how I would like for you to think about networking. Networking is research. That's what it is, research done by having com conversations to learn information, and to get advice. Networking is two-sided. You're not just there to learn information and get advice. In every conversation or meeting you have, you're always going to ask that person, is there anything I can do to help you? That makes networking inherently relational and reciprocal. There's a give and a take. It actually fosters a sense of trust and more of a peer-to-peer -peer relationship. And I think this is really important for people who think of networking as sucking up or schmoozing or begging for a job, right? Because when you network with the premise of saying, you know, how can I help you too? And it needs to be genuine. I'll give you some ideas later of things you can offer to help. It doesn't even need to be career help, by the way. But when you're genuinely saying, is there anything I can do for you? Then you're shifting that balance, OK? So it's about getting to know a particular person over the particular job or company they work for or whatever it may be. And to that point, I should say, you know, you should never, in most of your networking conversations and meetings, you should actually never expect for somebody to know of a job for you. Okay? Rarely are there, I mean, it's not always the case, but rarely will people be in a case where they can evaluate you against your skill set. They, they might not know how, how to evaluate your skill set based on your goals. 
or will they be assessing you against a particular hiring situation? So the thing with networking, patience is the name of the game. You're laying seeds, you're planting seeds, for, <laughs> laying seeds, planting seeds for the future when jobs open up down the line and you meet people who might have thought of you because you've built a relationship with them. Make sense? All right, so next thing, when you work, when you do network to learn information, to get advice, when you ask that person if you can help them, you are gaining allies. Allies who are gonna help you in your search or in your transition. Or if you're not in transition, who you could go back to and tap when you are in transition, okay? Really important because there is a hidden job market that exists. About 80 to 85%, according to Forbes and some other studies that have been done, 80 to 85% of executive level jobs are not posted. So your ability to get yourself into this hidden job market is going to require some face-to-face -face or at least some live contact. Think about it. If a hiring manager has an open position, the first thing he or she thinks is, who do I know that can do this job, right? And then they put feelers out to their network. So decision makers tend to look for, to their trusted circles first for suggestions and referrals. So what this means is, if you want to get into this hidden job market, you need to get out there and talk to people. You can't hide behind your computer screen. Make sense? There's a lot of people I know who look for jobs and tell me, I've been applying to like 100 jobs and I haven't heard back, right? You've got to get out. It, ta it, it takes getting out and having conversations, all right? Thoughts on this idea of what networking can be? Does this sound good to you guys? Or does it sound like BS for whoever said it was BS? Yeah? You're beginning to shift your perspective? Sure, hi. Where's the line between networking and friendships? Yeah. <laughs> um, that's, a good, that's a good question. Well, I think you can have many friends who are part of your network. In fact, your friends are great net people to network with, right? Because as I'll get to in a minute, when you're curating your contacts, family and friends are actually part of that bucket. So. You shouldn't expect there to only be family and friends, you know, relationship, and then there's a line or a demarcation between professional. Okay. Can I ask a question? Yeah. I think yeah. That's a really important question in Sloan. Like I have my own company that I built, and one of the disappointments for me was my network from Spain and from other places was really powerful. Mm. My network from Sloan was not because of that mindset of your four friends. We don't network. Interesting. And so I'm just, I think it's a really good question yeah. because I feel like friends don't ask friends for jobs. They oh. just talk about their families and we're kind to each other. We're almost too nice. Yeah. Whereas HBS, they get corrupt ass and say, yeah. give us a job and pay a lot of the money. So I'm just curious if you have any thoughts on that for this group. So I really, I, that's interesting because I have found when I'm helping alums, and typically I'm working with alums in career transition, that when they go out to their Sloan network in the appropriate way, because there are plenty of people who don't do this right, that they are more than helpful. Um, but one of the premises of intelligent networking, as we'll talk about today, is it using your family and friends as part of your network. So, I mean, I think what I'm trying to get at with this is networking, this view of networking is ongoing, it's relational, it's reciprocal. So friendships are give and take, right? Um, so the, the way you should approach networking should be as if you're cultivating a relationship. It doesn't have to be a friendship, but it's a, you know, you're, I'm interested in knowing you versus what you can do for me. So, so th thank you for that perspective. I had not heard that before. I think, I think it's a mindset for this group. Yeah. The, I think more the engineering, the kind of people that are lower key people. Yeah. Um, it, it's part of, I think the mindset piece for networking is so critical. Yeah. I do too, and we're going to talk about mindset. In fact, I have a whole slide on it. And you know, it's funny, now that you say that, I was meeting with an um, MBA la last week, and he said to me, I don't want to waste my time talking to my friends. i got to get out there and talk to people who are going to get me a job. And I was like, you need to watch my webinar, because this is available in a webinar format. So anyway, yes, friends are part. OK, good. Let's move on. So yes, please adopt this view ongoing, relational, re reciprocal, because I can tell you guys at your age and stage, this is where it's at. 
your ability to find an opportunity that's going to play to your strengths and align with your priorities and values. If you're in my earlier workshop, we talked about that kind of being the framework at which you look at your job search. Um, is going to happen when you're doing it through a network in a networked way. I've worked with many alums who've been able to get the inside scoop on jobs when they were in development, or they've been contacted later by people who had referred them for opportunities because they created an ally in their search. And I've even had a few who've had a job created for them because they impressed the hell out of somebody. You know, and that is done by networking. People hire people, so you've got to get out there and talk to people. Successful careers are built on relationships. So your ability to be successful is largely going to depend on how well you build, maintain, and engage your network, right? So moving on. Now, we're going to get into this roadmap. I have six steps for intelligent networking. This slide might be familiar or part of it from my earlier workshop because I have to hit the pause button before we jump into networking. Your ability to do your intelligent networking is only going to be as successful as the foundation you lay and the groundwork that you need to do before you get out there, okay? This requires some self-reflection. And as I said earlier, most people resist this. We wanna just go, go, go and do, 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 and we don't think about how we wanna present ourselves, what do we actually want. Oftentimes we're so reactive. Who's gonna hire me? What jobs are out there that I can fit myself or into, right? This Groundwork essentially involves your making two lists. And I have a much more detailed um, webinar on this that's available at MIT Sloan Alumni Online. My earlier workshop will be available in a couple weeks so you can get more information on this. But here's the gist, I'm just gonna cover it quickly. So each of these circles addresses an area of the, or an element of the job search that you can control. So I'll oftentimes say to alumni in transition, Let's start by making two lists. First list, core competencies, your strengths. What are those skills, the knowledge, the attributes that you possess that you want to use moving forward? So we do a, a list of our strengths, cross out the stuff you don't want to do anymore, and then you need to create stories around your strengths. I'm going really quickly through this, but there's a whole series of questions that I have that are designed to help you flesh out your core competencies. Okay. Next list your needs and preferences. I call this the require desire list. So what are the things that you must have in your next role? And what are the things that you'd like to have? To have the kind of work-life flow you want. And this is not about the work you're doing. This is about things like commute, compensation, culture of the company, size of the company, whether you have flexibility or not, whether you travel a certain percentage or don't travel at all. It's all those things that are gonna help make you productive and energized about the work you're going to do, okay? So this groundwork, getting really clear on these two things, helps you to really anchor yourself in what you bring to the table and what your priorities are going to be when you're moving forward in a transition. Because then comes this circle, the market. This is what you can't control. You can't control the opportunities in the market, the hiring conditions. But if you know what you want, and you know what you're good at, then you have a better chance of positioning yourself for this sweet spot right here. And as I said earlier, I've seen this open up possibilities for alums before. Oh, there's different industries I could try. Or I never considered this company. It actually aligns nicely with my required desire list, okay? And then this groundwork enables you to create what I call your career narrative, it's your pitch, right? That's how you're, the story you're gonna tell moving forward because it's all about stories. Stories are gonna enable you to um, communicate your value add, to communicate what's important to you. So this work needs to be done before your narrative happens. Your narrative is gonna be a big part of something you need to plan, prepare for before you start doing your informational or your networking meetings and conversations, okay? This helps you, actually it kind of motivates you and gets you kind of centered and grounded so you can, pro, you can do this from a place of confidence. I said earlier, I can't, now I've, ta I've taught to this my second workshop so I'm confusing what I've said. I really believe in being intentional about how you manage your career. Careers aren't things that you let happen to you, although most people do. They manage their career in a very passive way. This is actually about you're taking the reins and as much as you can, have a choice in the matter by being clear on your strengths and on your priorities. 
okay? And if you skip this process, I can pretty much guarantee you're gonna wind up being delayed, frustrated, or disappointed at some point in your search. So, all right, any questions on that framework? I had to pause and start there because this is where it all starts and now we can jump into the intelligent networking piece. All right, let's, let's move on. Oh, and that's sweet spot, okay. All right, so here's where we're going. So this is a, did somebody, oh yes. Can you, I'm sorry? Go back one slide? One slide, okay. Now know that this is gonna be on video and you will have the slides from this, okay? All right, you good? Okay, so here's where we're going today. We're gonna start with organizing your network. You're gonna communicate a tailored message, adopt a networking mindset to your point, conduct efficient informational meetings, keep expanding your network, and then staying engaged. So essentially, these are the steps that you would take when you're conducting a networked job search. And we're gonna drill down on the details of each in the coming slides and look at it through that lens. Now, I do wanna point out, I mentioned job boards earlier, right, when people get reactive and they're dumping their, job, their resumes into job boards. So I don't put a lot of emphasis on job boards in a job search. Now, I, I think of it as market research, right? Job boards are market research. They're gonna tell you what companies are growing, what companies are hiring, what the positions are available that are open and how they might align with your skills. But you can't conduct your job search in a vacuum. As I said earlier, if you wanna get into that hidden job market, you gotta get out there and talk to people. People hire people, right? So that face-to-face -face contact is so necessary. I actually have a quick email that I wanna read you that I got from an alum who graduated last year in 2018. I got this last fall. And this is, she just concluded a networked job search. So here's what she said. Bryn, thanks so much for your advice and guidance over the summer. My online job search of over 300 job applications resulted in a 7% response rate, 20 interviews, and no offers. When I used the networked approach to my search, I initially reached out to 18 contacts, which resulted in a 72% response rate. One of these was a former boss that had just started a new job in New York. Two months after he started, he brought me on board as VP of Operations at Sprinkler, a marketing technology company focused on enterprise social media management. I'm the first Sloney among the 1,500 global staff in a nine-year-old startup. There's a big learning curve, but I've been able to impact the functional areas where I have expertise in these first six weeks. So I think it's powerful to give this statement, right, this data to you from a fellow Sloney. Essentially, when you rely on job boards, you're letting the market dictate where you go. You're taking the power of your hands. So I'm not saying don't use job boards, but you have to have like this parallel approach, okay? And I would tilt more heavily on your networked search. All right, so let's drill down into organizing your network. Now I just said, this is gonna be a pretty tactical session. And the next couple of slides, I'm gonna kind of drill down on some like step, step, step. So rest assured that everything I'm talking about is actually in a two pager mobile app. It's on the mobile app and then we have some copies here. Oh, did you pass it out? Oh, great, oh good. So, so some of what, I, I don't know if you had enough copies for everybody, but okay, awesome, so that makes me happy. Because people get very, um, this is dense, and then people get caught up in it, so just listen to what I have to say. Everything's written down, you can go back to it later. Okay, cool? All right, we're gonna talk about organizing and then prioritizing your network. The key to networking is starting with who you know. So I want you to begin by curating your network. Now the most obvious place to look here is LinkedIn, right? It's everybody's virtual Rolodex. It's the most powerful professional networking platform out there. So what I recommend you do is you look at your first degree connections on LinkedIn, you download them into a CSV file and how to do that is on that sheet, okay? I don't, I'm not gonna get, go down the LinkedIn rabbit hole. So <clears throat> you're gonna download your connections and then you're gonna clean up your connections by using what I call the favor test. Here's the favor test. I believe quality over quantity of contacts, all right? So I would ask yourself, is this person 
someone I would ask the, a favor of. Would I ask this person to introduce me to someone that he's connect, he or she is connected to? And would I feel comfortable if that person asked me to introduce him or her to my connections? If the answer is yes, keep them. If the answer is yes, no, I would strongly suggest that you delete them. Now, I know, and they're not gonna get the, you're delinked or unlinked or whatever. They're, you can remove them as a connection and they're not gonna get a notice. I know there are plenty of people who might work in sales and business development who are gonna say, oh my God, I can't do that. It's my CRM system. So if you feel that strongly, then create a separate file. But I would also look at those people to see if they would pass the favor test, okay? So you're gonna clean up your connections. How many of you have over 500 connections? Yeah. And I'm gonna bet, when you look at them, you're not gonna know who like 20% of them are. So just get rid of them. They can't help you. What you wanna do is employ the favor test, as we'll, talk to in a, as we'll talk about in a minute, because your second degree connections are the people you have the potential to meet. But your ability to tap your second degree connections is only as strong as your relationship with your mutual connection, okay? So clean them up. And then you're gonna inevitably find that there are people that you are not connected to that you should be connected to. So I recommend that after you clean up your connections, you add new connections. And I typically have people look at four buckets, family and friends. Even though LinkedIn is a professional networking platform, your family and friends have professional connections. And if they pass the favor test, because I'm assuming they should, although I'm sure there's some that wouldn't, um, then they would be willing to do a favor for you, right? So it's okay to be connected on LinkedIn with your family and your friends. The second bucket is shared work experiences. So these are your colleagues, your former colleagues, your current colleagues, or vendors, or clients, or people that you're, you know through industry associations. Third bucket, alumni connections. So you guys are all here in this room. Perhaps you will make some new connections over the weekend. Think about the people that you went to school with. To, per your point, that you didn't feel like you could call on your classmates or they weren't that healthy, helpful. This is, you know, this that's not working. Or I'm sorry, it didn't work that way for you. Hopefully, it will now because everybody's going to be changing their mindset. All right. So alumni connections really powerful. And then fourth are any kind of community or volunteer connections you might have. So you know, people that you play tennis with or are your neighbors or the, um, your kids' friends' parents, people that you worship with, right? So people that are in your everyday life, your community, um, those are your four buckets. I have you start here because LinkedIn says those are actually your most powerful areas of connection. Now when you reach out, make sure, going back to our relational component of networking, that you are doing a personal note. You're not just doing the, I wanna join your network, right? Write a quick note. Hi, hope you're well. Looking at you know, curating my LinkedIn network and I notice we're not in touch. Hope everything's well with you and your family or whatever. You know, Make sure it's customized. I'd love to catch up soon. Okay? I saw a question over here. Did you? Yeah. So you were, you were uh, referring to the people that you would ask a question or you would be a favor. In the cleanup, I was also thinking the people that I would be, that I would be very comfortable helping. So where does that, is that part of your network when you are looking at uh, supporting others? Of course, because it's, it's two-sided. So you have to think about who can I offer to help as well as <laughs> who would I want to ask for help, okay? So the important thing here is that everybody who remains a first degree connection pass your favor test because intelligent networking involves at some point that you may very well reach out to every single first degree connection you have. May, not all at once and depending on how things go, you may not end up tapping everybody as you know, my, the alum I shared the email from, she just started with 18 people. But you wanna feel like you can and you very well may, depending on your network, tap everybody. Okay, so clean them up, add connections. Once you've got a handle on your first degree connections, you're gonna organize them based on your targets and what you've identified as a result of your groundwork. That's why that groundwork is so helpful. So perhaps you organize them with an emphasis on geography, right? I'm moving to the Bay Area, or you do it by industry or company 
or a keyword even, okay? But you wanna have some sort of way to organize them. Next, you wanna see who your first degree connections know. know. So the goal is to figure out who knows someone that you want to get in front of. Maybe they have a very cool functional role you want to learn about. Maybe they're in the location you want to move to. So who are your second degree contacts? As I said, those are the people that you have the potential to meet. I just did a coaching session um, earlier this week with someone who's just starting to do this and she has you know, 347 contacts. We looked at her second degree connections, 524,000. Right, so of course, she still needs to curate her network, but this is what I'm talking about. Your, your network expands so much more, but your ability to tap those people is only as strong as your mutual connection, okay? So to find your second degree connections, again, on the handout, you're just gonna look at advanced people search. You can click second, show me all my second degree connections. From there, you can further filter down on location, on industry, on company, so play around with it. All right, so now you've got a firm grasp on who you know and who they know. So now you wanna prioritize your outreach. Now, I said at some point you may very well message every first degree connection. So you're gonna start by reaching out to those you know well first. You have closer ties, they're low hanging fruit, you feel more comfortable before you progress, right, to those heavy hitters or those that you have weaker ties with or maybe those second degree connections. Okay, we're gonna talk about the messaging next as that might inform how you prioritize your outreach too. You're also gonna to wanna to create a system to manage this. It's gonna be really important for you to stay organized and track your contacts. I'm gonna show you an example of a contact tracker in a second. Okay, alums have used Excel and Google Docs. That seems to be kind of the best way to go. There is a job search app called Jibber Jobber that a couple alums have suggested. HubSpot also has a free CRM tool. I've, all this is in your handout as well. Um, it's, it's more for like business development, but you can tweak the fields. And then I just heard of a collaboration site a couple weeks ago from an alum called Airtable. It's more of a collaboration site, but this alum is using it for his job search as well and has had good things to say about it. So I throw those options out there for you to consider. All right, so let's summarize, because again, I know this was a dense slide. You're gonna Clean up your network, add missing connections, organize and categorize your connections, look at your second degree connections and see who you wanna request an introduction to, and then you're gonna prioritize your outreach. And you're gonna track it all on your trusty tracking system. Just for a visual, here is a, an Excel spreadsheet sent to me by an alum. I took out the company name, so that first column is just anonymous. So you don't have the names, or the names of the people. Actually, these were people that I took their names out. So he just put how he knew them, the last date of contact that he would always update, and any notes as to where things stood, okay? And if you look down at the bottom, I don't know if you can see all this, but like he did all his groundwork. So he, had, he did his competencies, his needs and preferences, then he had his contact, then he started to track his actual job search activity here, and then had a research tab. So. Organization is key, because it's really easy to start not knowing who the heck you're talking to. Yes? <clears throat> yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you know what? I actually do. There's an app and I am blanking on it, but somebody told me about an app. So I will, I don't know how I can get this information out. I will find out that app. Okay, <laughs> that's a good question. Um, this is a person who had literally like 7,000 LinkedIn contacts and had successfully gone through, cleaned them up and organized them with this app. So it's like, I don't know, maybe even Google, like how do I organize all my, I'll find it out for you. I am completely blanking. It's three syllables. That doesn't help you, but <laughs> I'll find it out. All right, now let's move on to messaging and then we can get on to the better stuff. So now you have cleaned up your contacts. So the next step is you're gonna communicate with them. All right, and so what I suggest you do is come up with three types of messages. All right, that you may end up sending to everybody depending on your relationship, but here's where we're going. First message, 
This is just a general update email to people that are, it's typically your family and friends, to those with no known ties to your target. And the purpose of this email is just to say, yeah, I mean, it's really kind of putting yourself out there. It's declaring to the universe that you are ready to look for something, or you want to have a you want to have a conversation about what's next, you're ready to do some research, you're ready to explore. So you just want to give them an update on you and clarify what your intentions are. What you're, you're starting to explore your next steps in your career. So you're going to use some elements of that narrative that I talked about earlier and ask them to keep you in mind if they know anybody you should be speaking to. So it might sound like this. And these examples are also in the handout, so don't stress if I'm... So hi, you know, quick pleasantries, whatever you need to say that's personal to that person. I'm starting to explore new ways to leverage my product manage ex management expertise in a smaller, more nimble tech company in the Bay Area. I'm open to any ideas or learning about contacts you have that might help me move closer to my goal. Right? And then, of course, heeding that reciprocal component, you're going to say, if I can ever be of help to you, don't hesitate to ask. Right? Or please let me know if there's anything I can do for you. Something like that. Something short and sweet. The reason you should send these general update emails is because you never want to assume that someone you know and trust is unable to help you. Someone could yield a very vital piece of information that can transform your job search. I've seen it happen time and time again. I have stories. Most recently, I had someone who sent this general update email to their cousin. Their cousin went to college with like the CEO of the company they wanted to talk to. Ended up having a couple of interviews and a job. And never would have known if he had not reached out to his family and friends, okay? And you also can't assume that everybody's gonna be carefully curating their LinkedIn network like you are, so you never know who somebody actually knows. So that general update email is important. Second, you're gonna send an email to the first degree connections you have that are aligned in some way, shape, or form with your targets. And the purpose of this email is to ask them for a meeting because you want to learn information and get some advice from them. Okay. I'm, I'm not gonna read the sample email because I've got it in the handout, unless you want me to. Anybody want it? Want a little sample, want a little, how would this sound? Yes? Perhaps I'm going back to the first. Oh, okay. Um, but they're also recruiters and other career uh, development folks that I have as part of my network. Are they considered as my first connections, or I mean, how do I treat them? Are they people you would know, you know and trust? I've worked with them in the past. Okay. Would they pass the favor test? It's different. They, they get paid for it, but yes. Would they pass the, the favor <laughs> test, though? Would you feel comfortable? I'm talking I mean, about the opposite, just sending a note. The right? general email yeah. that are not aligned with your targets? So the recruiter is not aligned with your targets, is what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I would take a look at their profile to see what they're looking at if they have specialties. But yeah, I would send them the general update email. If they pass the favor test, why not? You never know. If they don't answer you, which you're going to get people who don't answer you, then that's OK. I think so. All right. So that's that next one about asking for an email for a meeting. So you'd use your same kind of premise. I'm starting to look for new blah, blah, blah. And then it would just be, would you be willing to meet with me in the next few weeks so I can learn about your experience in the industry or, you know, or your experience at your company, whatever. I'll have no more than five questions and shouldn't take more than 20 minutes of your time. So you're being very specific about what they can expect from you. And then, of course, you're going to say, if I can offer to be of help to you, don't hesitate to ask. Notice I have not used the word networking at all in these emails. Now, the last type of email you're going to send is for those where you found a second degree connection that you want to meet in your target industry, function, location, company, whatever it may be. But there's not a need to talk with the first degree connection. Although, of course, it might make sense in some cases to do so. Okay? So the purpose of your email is to ask them to make the introduction for you. Okay? And remember, these people have passed the favor test, so this should not be a stretch. So you would do your opening narrative, and then say something like, I've noticed you have a first degree connection on LinkedIn with Mary Pat, who's working in the industry I'm interested in pursuing. Would you consider asking if she'd be willing to take a short informational meeting with me? I'll take about 20 minutes and have an efficient five-step agenda. Thanks for your assistance as I begin to research my next steps, and please know I'm more than happy to return the favor. So something like that. Now, with all these emails, I, 
I do recommend this website, themuse.com. Has anybody seen The Muse? It's a job search website. They've got some really good um, articles and advice, and most specifically this template, these templates, the 28 key email templates for 2018, has things from you know, talking to someone you haven't talked to in years to asking a close friend for advice, okay? It's very thorough, it covers all sorts of situations, and um, I suggest you use it as kind of inspiration for your own. You had a question. So that's a whole nother, I mean, doing a confidential job search is definitely something you're gonna to wanna to keep in mind. So if you are, like I wouldn't be messaging people in your current company if you're trying to do something confidential, right? So that's gonna be maybe people you don't want to include. Um, yeah, you have to be a little bit more, more on the down low in terms of how you're positioning yourself on things like LinkedIn, I'd say. But you can, you can do all of these things. You just won't communicate with people that are in your current company. Yeah. Okay. All right, so these are the types of messages you're going to be creating and sending to your contacts. You're going to send them individually, customized by name and tailored to that specific person or situation. Um, and just one final word on this, because sometimes I'm working with people who've taken extended career breaks and they feel very nervous about reaching out to people that they haven't spoken to for years. And so here's what I have to say about that. You know, have these people who, you, who have passed the favor test, have they reached out to you in the intervening years? And if they did, would you be happy to hear from them? Oftentimes when you take a career break, People's image of you is frozen in time, just as your image of them is frozen in time if you haven't been in touch with them. You still remember them as they were in the last work situation you had. They're still gonna have that memory of you as well, okay? So it's perfectly fine to resurrect these old relationships. I would just say, what would you wanna hear from them if they reached out to you? And just keep that in mind when you're crafting your note, okay? All right, so now you're ready to work, to network. Let's clarify and define the goals of your networking conversations and meetings. So here's the deal. We covered this before, but I'll just go a little bit more in depth. Like I said, you're there to learn information and to get advice. The purpose of these meetings is not to give a long, detailed overview about every single thing you've done. It's a conversation. It's not, an, it's not like a speech, okay? And so sometimes I think what happens in the networking meetings is it goes off the rail, rails because people get nervous and they talk too much and then they're overloading and, you know, frankly boring the person with everything they say because they don't really care about everything you've done since you graduated from high school, right? So remember that you're there to get some feedback, some advice, maybe some redirection on your search, okay? So you're there to listen. Um, next, you want to get referrals. When this applies to a job search, of course, when you're networking and not in a job search, you're not gonna ask people who else should I be talking to necessarily. But the goal here, if you're in a network job search, is to ask the person, is there anyone else I should be speaking to who could be helpful to me or to whom I could be helpful? To your point about there's people that you'd wanna help. I mean, offer help. This has the power really to transform the nature of this whole networking thing. Because when you're making it more balanced and reciprocal, there's more of a peer-to-peer -peer relationship. I think I said that already. So the more people that know you, the more your name's getting circulated, the more you have the potential to get into that hidden job market, okay? So you have to ask this question. The other piece I wanted to say about um, second degree connections earlier, there was a study done in the early 2000s, and this was pre-LinkedIn days, but essentially what they found is that second degree connections, um, that's stealing LinkedIn terms, I think it was like once removed, are arguably more powerful than your first degree connections because You've been introduced by a trusted referral. You've got a trusted referral, but these second degree connections have no preconceived notions about what you can or cannot do. They don't know you or anything about you, so you're basically a blank slate. All they know is that someone they presumably like and trust has, been, has connected them to you. So second degree connections can be very powerful. So asking your contacts who else you should be speaking with is real in for specific introductions, which we'll talk about when we get into the meeting structure, is really important in getting traction in a job search. Now, if you approach your networking conversation strategically, 
if you ask if you can help them as well, you're going to get these allies who are going to go, bat, go to bat for you. They're going to check internal listings at their company to see if there's a fit for you. They're going to forward your resume or your LinkedIn. They're going to give you names of contacts. They're going to recommend you for project work. They're going to keep you in mind when something comes down, open up down the line. They might even meet with you another second or third time. So getting these allies is really helpful. And the way to get that is by offering to be helpful in return. Okay. So approaching that networking as give and take, it really is transformative in terms of how it greases the wheels. And I've, I've heard this from alums who've used the five-step structure, which I've actually sourced from a book. And I'll tell you about that book in a second. But they've actually said, when I shifted it from kind of here's what I need to like let's just see what we need on a peer-to-peer -peer level, that's when really things really started to pick up. All right. So I see my mind, the person who asked about mindset left, but that's OK. You're all here. <laughs> so here's this slide. As a result of curating your network, as a result of communicating effectively, let's say you've now lined up these meetings with first and second degree connections, people you know and people you don't know. So let's think about meeting somebody. You're going to be evaluating and observing their interpersonal style and how they act, as well as their abilities and what they, as related to what they do. So they too, if you flip it around on you, they're going to be looking at you, and they're going to be evaluating your interpersonal skills and your executive style just as much, if not more so, than your technical abilities. OK? So what, how you want to come across in a networking meeting? You want to be strategic. You want to know why you're there. You want to know what you want to accomplish. You want to be well organized. You want to keep a close tab on topics and on time. You want to manage the meeting well, because you called it. You want to be positive. You want to have an upbeat tone, overall positive language. You want to be gracious, appreciative of the time that they're giving to you, because time is a gift. And you also, I know I'm sounding like a broken record, you want to be reciprocal. You want to ask again, is there anything I can do for you? Now, if you've been successful in your career so far, I probably, as most of you have, you've probably proven your capacity for doing all these things. And doing that groundwork I mentioned, too, is going to help you get there to, further because it's going to really ground you and give you a place where you can start internally from, from strength and confidence. So let me say something about confidence. If you feel that you cannot demonstrate all these things, in a networking meeting or conversation, don't do it. Don't have the meetings. Wait until you're ready. So being in transition is difficult. And I sit with people every week who are in transition. And depending on the cause of it or the situation, there can be anger, there can be grief, there can be sadness, shame around it. These are all natural, typical responses to being in transition. So it's OK. I've been, I've, I've been in transition myself. Everybody in this room has been in transition at some point in their career. OK? So if you're in that transition period and not feeling this, don't do your networking meetings. Because if you come across as being bitter or angry about your former employer, that is not going to get you allies. Right? And it's not going to get you passed along in the hidden job market. So what I say to people sometimes is just take some time, process it, lean into it. We talked about this in the earlier session. You know, just lean into wherever you're at. And oftentimes, you'll find that with some distance, you're going to have a better perspective on your situation. Make sense? All right. Yes. It's another of Sometimes it may not be anger, but it may be confusion about where you fit in the, in the world. Um, uh, maybe your industry has changed, uh, or there's some dislocating thing. Yes. Or being in the fog. Yeah. And it's a lot like having a new product where you don't really know what the market is. And the tendency is to want to try to execute us <coughs> getting in the funnel. Yep. And if you try to get into the funnel too quickly, you end up just wasting a lot of time. I was curious if you have any suggestions how to get out of the fog and to, mm -hmm. you might really have three or four or five different directions you can go yeah. 
which makes it sound like you're not focused, but you really need to, to kind of play with you. Yeah, okay. So for those who didn't hear and for the uh, video, um, you're talking about how there are times when you're in a fog and you don't know your direction, but you really need to get going, okay? So I will go back and say, first of all, everybody's situation is different, so I would encourage you to talk to somebody like a coach like me or somebody else, but you do need to give yourself some time because when you jump in, you will screw yourself. I just spoke with someone last week who called me in February after she'd been let go, and she was like, just got my severance package and I need a new job. And she was you know, not in the place at all. And I just said, take a little time, let's talk in a couple weeks. She didn't call me until last week. And she was like, I'm in such a better place now. Now, not everybody has the luxury of taking four months after they've been, or three months or however long it was. Um, but there needs to be some time and then there needs to be, you need to have a sounding board. So you need to have somebody to pressure test your ideas to make sure that you're focused. Because the worst thing you can do is not be um, focused, as I said in the first session too, you wanna have a direction you're moving in, or maybe there's multiple directions. Maybe there's a, I could do A, B, or C, but you wanna have a clear story for each and have it make sense. Because if, you, if you're not, you're not gonna come off as organized or as focused, and that's gonna affect it. I don't know if I answered your question. There's no, it really is so individual, right? But bottom line, what I was wanting to say is when you can do that groundwork I talked about with some energy and optimism behind it, because I think it does go back to doing that groundwork, then you're probably ready to move forward with your meetings, okay? Any questions or comments on that? All right. Oh, yes, yeah. Just a comment. It, yeah. It seems so important when you work with networks to also <coughs> some of the serendipity in it. Mm -hmm. So by getting going, I mean, you, you don't want to wait too long, right? Because uh, when you have those trusted contacts, you, you might also be able to entrust some of their minds into this, and they might also come with some ideas that help you create that direction. Yep, so to your point about timing, I think it's just so individual for everybody. If you have a trusted contact, that you feel like you've built a relationship with because it's not just you've called them when you need something, right? Then it doesn't really matter if they, you call them within a week or within three weeks. So I hear your point and I, it's a point well taken. I think you're not gonna, you know, there is a point where, you know, somebody's gonna have to say, get out of bed and take a shower. Like, <laughs> no, I'm kidding, you, but I'm not. I mean, there are people that you have to, you know, but there are, it's, there comes a point when you start to, you really need a kick in the butt to get going. Um, but I do think people in general tend to rush into this too quickly. They don't take that time to do the groundwork that I talked about earlier. Okay? Yes? What's a good system test for whether not or assessing whether you're trying too hard? Uh, question being, I put myself out there. I feel like I've really networked very effectively, but I want to get a sense still about was that trying too hard? Should I have taken a step back and just reflected a little bit? Mm -hmm. So what's kind of a good litmus test for that? Well, my immediate response, or like what I kind of feel when you ask that question is, if you think you're trying too hard, then maybe you are. Um, if it doesn't feel genuine and like relational, if it feels like a little forced in some ways, it probably is. But let, let's look at the, how you're doing your meetings and how you're structuring them. And let me kind of go through this five step and then we'll just kind of see like, how does that relate to how you've been talking and how you've been managing the meeting, okay? All right, so what I wanna introduce now is a five step, five question, 20 minute networking meeting structure that I sourced from a book called The 20 Minute Networking Meeting. Um, I really like their model for very concise, effective meetings. If you're interested in getting the book, I can't say it's the best written book I've ever read, but it is definitely informative and it's a how-to with tons of examples. Get the executive edition. They have one for new college grads. They have a graduate edition. I would just recommend you get the executive edition if you're gonna wanna get it, okay? So why 20 minutes? So I mentioned this early, earlier. One of the reasons people dread networking and you get the anxiety, soul sucking, whatever, when you ask about how people view networking is because most networking meetings are way too long and they're way too unfocused. 
everyone feels like their time is wasted. So think about it this way. I said this earlier, time is a gift. Everyone who's gonna take the time to meet with you is giving you the gift of their time. Time that could be otherwise spent billing clients or doing their work or other personal or professional obligations that they have. So if somebody's gonna take an hour out of their time to meet with you, that's gonna delay things that are gonna get pushed to later in the day. So you wanna think about respecting people's time and not squandering it. Let me show you these five steps. And I, as I mentioned earlier, some alum, I, I've had alums use this with really good success. I've had people call it transformative. I've had people say, I wish I read, used this years ago. It would have been so much more effective. So 20 minutes, minutes is indeed enough time to have a good opening, right? So you're gonna have a few minutes of chit chat and opening conversation. Present your narrative and your overview that concisely tells somebody who you are and what you're doing. Have a solid discussion around your background and goals for you to learn information and gather advice. As I said, that's the goal. Close the conversation promptly and allow yourself and your other person that you're meeting with to get on with his or her day, okay? The final stage is done after the meeting. That's the follow-up when you're gonna send your thank yous and execute on any action items that you came up with. So remember the goals of networking. Advice, information, referrals. A-I-R, air. You need a little acronym. Advice, information, referrals, that's what you're there for. And if you do that well, then you'll get allies, which is the, the other goal, okay? You're not there to have long, detailed discussions. You wanna use people's time wisely. Now, these steps here may seem obvious and like things that you know. We're gonna drill down on each in the coming slides. What I find is people know this, but they don't really know it. <laughs> so it seems obvious, but rarely do people take the time to prepare to practice and to really focus in order to do this effectively and efficiently, okay? So let's drill down on each step and we'll start with that first impression. So you know the whole adage, you never get a chance to make a first impression. So here's what you're gonna do. You're gonna arrive early, but not too early so that you can appear calm and steady and not frazzled. Know that your first impression is gonna begin the moment you walk in that door, whether or not you're speaking directly to the person that you're there to meet yet, okay? So if you appear frazzled or you're short with the receptionist or the person at the office or whatever, that can get passed along, okay? So going back to that mindset I'd said earlier that you wanna adopt, that's why it's so important for you to be steady and clear and focused, okay? Get yourself in that networking mindset, use it from the get-go. Um, has anybody heard of Amy Cuddy? She's a social psychologist at HBS. She has a 15 minute TED talk, yes, so power, on the power pose. So if you haven't seen it, it's a 15 minute TED talk. I like it, I recommend it to people before you go into any high stakes situation, an interview, in a networking meeting or conversation. It just has the ability to kind of ground yourself and get your neurons firing in a way that allows you to come across as being confident. Amy Cuddy, yeah, Amy Cuddy. C-U-D-D-Y, yeah, if you just Google her TEDx talk, it's the first thing that will pop up, yeah. Yeah, okay. All right, so first impression, then you're gonna express thanks. Remember, you wanna show gratitude. It's about offering to be of help, showing gratitude, right? So you're gonna do the firm handshake, the warm smile, the eye contact. Nice to meet you, Jim. Thanks for taking the time to meet with me today, right? Or good to see you again. I really appreciate the time you, you've agreed to take with me. You're gonna have a few minutes of chit chat, of course. Rather than talk about the weather or sports, use that time to highlight any mutual connections that you have with that person. So maybe the person who introduced you to the contact. Uh, our friend Ken says, hello, we used to work together at Wayfair and he was a great colleague, right? Or I noticed you used to be at Bitcoin. We might have some common acquaintances there. Do you know Mary Pat? Right? So highlight those mutual connections. It can be a nice bridge, particularly if you're meeting with someone that you don't know. And then a few minutes of chit chat is fine, but then you wanna get down to business. Remember that you called the meeting, so it's your, it's your responsibility to run the meeting. This is where most networking meetings go off the rails again. The person that has asked for the meeting starts to defer to the person who they're meeting with because they wanna be respectful, 
And then that person starts to think, what the heck am I doing? Like, why, why am I talking and what's happening? Who's managing this meeting? And that's when people feel like their time is getting wasted and you're not going to get allies out of that kind of meeting. Okay, so you really need to get down to business and set the agenda quickly. Here's some ways to do that. I want to be respectful of your time today, so I'll take no more than and I'll take no more than 20 minutes. I'd like to give you a, a brief sense of my background and then get a, your perspective on a few things that relate to my transition. Okay? Or this should be brief, Matt. My plan is to share an overview of my background and ask a few questions as it relates to my search. Yeah. Is there a risk that that can backfire because it seems like you're not actually really interested in the other person? Like, I've, I've had that actually happen to me when I, a more junior person sort of approached me and was like, here's my agenda, this is what I have, but had, had sounded like they wanted to learn more, and, and I just got a really, you get a, kind of a gross feeling like you're just there to like provide a... So I think the first thing I'd say is you, you do need to be flexible. Like this time frame is not hard and fast. If you feel like the chit chat needs to go on longer, then have it go on longer. But the point is you need to lead. You need to lead the meeting. You called the meeting, you need to manage the meeting. Remember how I said earlier, you wanna lead with like, it's, a, it's as, just as much of an evaluation of your executive style and presence as anything else, right? So um, yes, be flexible you, I, in every situation because these are also different. If you're not feeling the vibe or if that person is talking way longer and it's gonna be weird to cut them off or it's gonna feel curt, then don't do it. But you also want to show that you're focused and you're organized and that you're not afraid to lead. Fine line. Yeah. And then you can ask another option, maybe like make it a multiple interaction situation where like maybe they talk a lot the first time, but then you can follow up and get. Well, I wouldn't presume you're going to get that second chance. So I, I do think it's really important to kind of come across as I'm here to do business, I'm going to be respectful, and so that's how you set it up. 20 minutes, if it ends up going a little longer, I mean it does, but I would, I think you're gonna be better off trying to have this kind of more focused and organized approach rather than whatever happens, happens. So, all right, any questions on that? Thank you for your comment. Any, anybody else have a, any other thoughts? I thought I saw a question here, no? Okay, all right. So now let's go to the overview. So now you're gonna take about a minute to briefly tell the person a little bit about you, share your functional and industry expertise as it's related to your target and your goals. A one minute overview is strategic and it's efficient. Remember how I said you're not there to kind of go on and on about you. You just wanna provide the person with a little bit of context on who you are and what you've done. You're gonna lose people if you drone on and on. So to create your overview, I actually had, um, Julia, sorry, um, pass out a career narrative handout from my first session. Essentially, when you're talking about your career narrative, and this will be on the mobile app too, you're gonna answer three questions. Who am I? Give a little context, an idea of your background. What do I do well? This is where you're gonna pull from that strengths list. This is why the groundwork is very important. Perhaps you'll give an example to make it real for the person. You wanna have good tangible examples of how you've leveraged your strengths and your areas of expertise. And then what's important to me or what am I targeting next and why? That's where you're gonna pull from that required desire list. So you might wanna review that navigating your career at any age and stage workshop to give you more information on how to put together this narrative. I do suggest timing and recording yourself on, the, on your phone so that you can get to a point where you can deliver this in about a minute, a minute 30 tops, okay? As I said, you'll record yourself the first time and be horrified. Then you'll go back, you'll revise, and you'll edit, get to a point where it feels, you know, prepared, not robotic, but natural to you, okay? Really important to have that narrative. That's gonna really help cement that good first impression too. So now let's move on to the discussion. So this is the most important part of the meeting. You also wanna keep on point here, so keep things efficient. Your discussion is going to consist of five questions, three that you design and are specific to that person, and then two will be the same every time, okay? Now the three questions that you prepare are probably gonna be about the person you're meeting with, that person's company or industry or function or something about their background. 
In order to prepare effective questions, you've got to do your homework first. So you should, before you go meet with anybody, take a look at the company website, do a little research on their company. You should also be familiar with the markets, the economy, the local, regional, national news, right? what's going on in the world, politics. You should also do your research on the person. Look at their LinkedIn bio, look at their bio on the company website, or their LinkedIn profile rather, their bio on the company website, or any other generally public publicly available information about them, okay? As you find yourself reading about the person, if you find things that you um, are curious about, that's gonna be fodder for your question. The point is, when you're designing the first three questions, the questions that you're gonna ask to the person, you never wanna ask a question that you know the answer to, right? How many of you have had networking meetings and the person's like, can you tell me about your career path? So that's annoying. They could have found that out on their own. That's not gonna get you an ally, right? So make good use of people's time. The three questions that you're gonna uh, prepare, you wanna have thought-provoking questions, maybe questions only that person can answer, but that are gonna make that person think and take advantage of their unique um, situation. I always say, make the question, this is also a theme in all, if you've seen any of my career webinars, I talk about in salary negotiation, you make a statement, you ask a question. In interviews, you make an observation, and then you ask a question. Let me give you an example. So your first question could be something like this. I was reading your LinkedIn profile and saw that you did commercial business ops and consumer goods before you transitioned to pharmaceuticals. So that's an observation. As I look at a similar transition, are there any insights that you could share from pivoting industries? That's your question. Right? Or, I noticed we both hold a Sig Six Sigma black belt. Observation. I feel interest in Six Sigma is waning. I'd be curious to hear your take on that. Or, you know, how has your organization evolved in its use of Six Sigma methodology? Question, okay? I like this formula because the observation gives the listener a heads up as to where you're going, and it also shows that you did your homework. The question draws upon their opinion, their expertise, their experience, so it's relevant to them, okay? So the first three questions drafted by you will be specific to the person with whom you're meeting. Of course, feel free to take a question and use it in multiple meetings because you might wanna get multiple viewpoints on a particular question, of course, right? But really try and tailor your questions to that person. It can really pay off for you. Question four accomplishes that goal of getting referrals. This is when you're gonna ask, is there anyone else I could be speaking with? Remember, if you don't ask, you're not gonna be expanding your network. The more people that you know, or the more people you're able to meet with, the more you're gonna be able to infiltrate that hidden job market, okay? So you really need to ask this question. And it can be asked simply, you know, I only have a couple more questions. First, is there anyone else you think I should be meeting with given my background or goals? You could also get more specific. Is there anyone else in your marketing department that I could speak with, right? Or, I noticed you used to work at Apple. Might there be anybody there that you think it would be worth for me to talk to? And if so, would you be willing to tee up the, the um, introduction? Okay. Note, these are all phrased um, directly, but courte courteously. How you ask is important. If though you have managed the meeting well, you've stayed on point, you've made a good first impression, this should incentivize people to help connect you. You will hopefully have gained an ally. And then you've got the final question. How can I help you? It's that reciprocal piece. It really will shift the nature of the conversation. This question has been so powerful. I've talked to alums who've said, I really catch people off guard when I do this. I kind of like doing it now. So, so many people neglect to do this in their networking. But showing that, con that consideration can yield an additional con contact, maybe even if that person was hesitant at first to give up a name, that's gonna open it up even more or it's gonna gain you an ally who's gonna think of you down the road when things open up. And this question accomplishes that goal, making a new ally, right? Someone who's gonna make introductions, someone who's gonna recommend you for project or contract work, someone who's gonna give you another meeting so you can have your multiple meetings, get to know them more.
right? Now, if the person looks surprised or caught off guard because you ask, how can I help you? What I would do is think about when you're doing your research on that person, what is something you could offer them in return? Or maybe the discussion you've had has given you some ideas. So maybe it's something like, oh, you know, uh, you mentioned you really admired Andrew Lowe. I worked with him on my thesis. It's been a while, but I'd be happy to make that connection if you like. Or maybe you notice the person likes something that's in their office. They like golf. You're obviously a, a golfer. I belong to this club. If you ever want to come and play nine holes, I'd be delighted to have you as my guest. Right? See how it goes. Or I'm doing an industry function in September. I'd be happy to send you a couple tickets if you'd like to go or send anybody on your team. Or maybe you just have an article or a TEDx talk that you want to pass along, or a podcast you like to listen to that you can recommend. Or maybe there's a business book you like in particular that you could bring as a token of your appreciation. You want to think about something that you could offer, because you do need to be genuine when you ask this question. Okay. So that offer to help goes such a long way. It's a critical part of networking, and it can really speed up your transition. So those are the five questions. You should always end with that last question, how can I help you? It allows you to lead with that, leave with that solid impression. Any comments or thoughts on this discussion piece? Like I said, you know, be flexible, right? You, this is where you know, the bulk of the discussion is. So manage your time well, but you know, be sensitive to the way it's going and the information you're getting. You don't want to be rude. It might be counter, counterproductive to kind of keep things moving. At the same time, you are also going to be cognizant of the fact that you called the meeting, and it's your responsibility to manage the meeting. So you want to land the plane here. Even though 20 minutes may seem short and the conversation could go on and on, you know, don't they always say, leave them wanting more, right? So <laughs> get out while the getting's good. So close the conversation. Even though it could go on for longer, again, it's going back to that gift of time. Don't squander their time, right? So thanks again for your time. I'm going to let you get back to your day. I so appreciate, you know, the information and advice you've been willing to share with me. Once you make it clear the end is near, then it's time to wrap it up, review any action items that you've discussed. If they've offered to get, make an introduction for you, offer to send them something that they can easily cut, paste, or forward to the contact to make it easier for them to make that introduction. If you've offered to make introductions, let them know when, you, when they can expect that. So confirm any action items that you've had. Say thank you again. I know I keep talking about that, but I just can't overstate enough how much this infuses appreciation for the person that you've been meeting with, when your contacts feel appreciated, they're gonna, it could pay off for you. And then you're gonna promptly wrap it up. Again, I say you ask for the meeting, you end it, okay? Keep things crisp and on point. Now, once the meeting is over, within the first 24 hours, you wanna send a thank you email to the person that you just met. You also, if applicable, want to send an email to the person who introduced you to the person that you met. Again, we're talking about relationships, ongoing, reciprocal. People will appreciate being informed when they've made this introduction and done a favor on your behalf and you follow up with them to thank them and tell them that you had the meeting. You also want to go back to your contact tracker and update information. Keep yourself organized. Write down any notes while they're still fresh in your mind. And then finally, you're going to want to make a note when to follow up with that person again. you got to stay on the radar. So you're going to want to touch base with your contacts every so often. I'll talk about that. I have a slide on timing in a second. OK? All right. So let's talk about the timeline of all this. So hopefully now you have a little more energy around how you're going to approach networking conversations. Although I can tell you guys are a little tired. I think you're ready for drinks. So I'm going to speed this up. So. Um, what I'll say here, the alums I've worked with who have used this format have found it's enabled them to make stronger impressions, to have better discussions, to get more contacts, right? So though, that's what you want. All those things can lead to more opportunities for you. Now, when you're applying these principles that we just discussed in a network uh, job search, here's what I've found. On average, this can take about six months. Here's a little more granular level to that. Now, to do that, 
you're going to want to aim to have about two to four meetings a week. Okay? Now, it could take reaching out to six to eight people to get one meeting. That ratio is going to be a lot less when you're working with, within your first degree connection. So remember, I would said you might reach out to everybody. So start closer ties first. But the further you go out, you're going to have to experiment to see how you need to feed that pipeline in order to keep up this type of meetings. Okay? Aim to touch base with your contacts about every six weeks or so, just to check in. How are things going? Maybe you've revised your search. I wouldn't check in any more often like that uh, than that unless you have a meaningful reason to do so. Maybe there's information you've learned that would be helpful to them. Maybe your mutual connection has a news and you want to share it, something like that. But every six weeks is just enough to stay on the radar and stay top of mind. If you don't follow up, you're going to be forgotten. And then once you've landed, once you've gotten your new role, you want to continue to stay engaged. This is an ongoing process. I always say continue to build your network before you need it. So you're going to let everybody know where you landed, thank them for their help, continue to send, you know, in for, I call them goodies as, as appropriate. Say you come across an article and you think of the person or you like a podcast, think who would appreciate this. It gives you an excuse to reach out. And then you have excuses to reach out. Holidays, great time of the year to cull your network and to curate your network, checking in, or the new year. Or on LinkedIn, they'll, oftentimes you'll get a pop-up. You, you know, this is this person's work anniversary. Or sometimes they have birthdays, although I don't recommend that you put your birthday on your LinkedIn profile, identity theft. In any case, it'll give you some reason to reach out to people. And you want to continue to nurture relationships even when you're not in a job search. Now you don't have to stick to 20 minutes. Now you can have dinner and drinks and lunch and coffee. So aim to just, even if it's one meeting a month, aim to keep it going. So it's kind of like use it or lose it. If you don't keep it going, you're going to forget. Okay? All right. I had a final poll everywhere. What's the key takeaway you'll use moving forward? However, given how slowly the responses came in, you're welcome to still respond, but I'm not going to trust that it's all going to come up quickly, and I know we're getting towards the end of the time. Any last questions? I'll kind of give you my key takeaways, but just any last thoughts or a key takeaway that someone's going to use moving forward? Yeah. What are your thoughts on recruiters and how to leverage recruiters in this process? Mm -hmm. the Great question about recruiters. OK. So there's two types of recruiters. There's retained exec search recruiters, and there's contingent recruiters. Retained exec search uh, firms are hired exclusively by the company, paid by the company. They typically pay about a third of the person's first year salary to find talent for roles. And they're retained, so the client is the company. Okay? Typically, these search firms are looking for plug and play. You've done this job somewhere before, you might be a good con uh, contact to do it there. So if you're pivoting industries or, or functions, it could be, it, it's going to be a little difficult to get on that radar. I like retained search firms. They typically play at a base salary of 200 k above. Okay, So it cannot hurt you to reach out to certain search firms. And there's five big ones, Spencer Stewart, Hydrogen Struggles, these sounding familiar, Russell Reynolds, Agon Zender, Corn Ferry. You can look on these websites, look at their practice areas and locations, reach out to the, pr the practice lead in your specialty, just get on their radar, but know that they're working for a company, they're not working for you, okay? And just kind of know that's, that's kind of how it works. Now, contingent recruiters, so first of all, if you get tapped on LinkedIn and said, hey, I've got this great job for you, are you interested in this job? I would always ask the person, have you been retained by the company for this job? A lot of recruiters use LinkedIn to just kind of fish for you, hook you, get you interested in a role, but they won't tell you about the company or the role. And then you become, how do I say this? Like you get a price tag on your head because they're going to get paid if they get you into the company. So sometimes there are, there are needs for recruiters. There are boutique firms that work in very niche areas. And if you don't have a lot of contacts, first of all, they're going to want, you're going to do better if you've got the experience when you're working with a recruiter. They want a sure thing, okay? But you can have conversations with them. I would just always be clear about what their relationship is and how they're going to get paid. Because there are recruiters who will use you. 
you get that price tag on your head and then they go to you they go they take you to a company so you always need to be clear when you're talking to a recruiter sorry I'm not being very articulate when you're talking to a recruiter I would be clear with them I'm not giving you permission to shop my resume around okay I'm happy to talk to you about what I want to do and get your thoughts and ideas of course they're and then they're gonna to want to connect with you and get all your contacts on LinkedIn I have a little um, jaded view of contingent recruiters but you know, have the conversation, but just make it really clear, I'm leading my own job search. Unless you have a relationship, they give you real companies with real roles, and they're open and transparent. I welcome any other thoughts on that, if there's anyone who's done headhunting or recruiting. No? Okay. So good way to use, that's how I'd use them in the job search. I'd look at retained firms. Um, and then you can, you can also see if there's any boutique or niche firms that have, you know, somewhat reliable references or that you've been referred to, okay? All right, so guys, as a result of attending this very tactical workshop, I hope you will consider curating your network, okay? Do what makes sense to you and I will find out the three syllable app that's gonna help you get, whittle down your contacts. Use my acronym of AIR, advice, information, referrals. That's your networking goal. Effective networking meetings have a beginning, a middle, and an end. So prepare for your meeting and manage that meeting well. That will cultivate allies for you who will hopefully continue to go to bat for you and help you in your search. And again, I can't overstate enough that reciprocal back and forth. Get on that peer-to-peer -peer level, have trust, and that relationship will serve you well throughout your entire career. So, all right, thank you for joining me today. It's been a pleasure. You have lots of handouts. Everything's on the mobile app. Our career office is here to support you through transitions if you need it. So make sure to reach out to us if we can be of help, okay? Enjoy reunion and go get some drinks. Some people need drinks. <laughs>